Hello, dear friends. If you would like to, you can unmute your machines and say hi to each other and uh, to our presenter, to our guest, too, Van, Van James from Hawaii. Hello, I'm Zhao oh. from Taiwan. Yes. I want oh. to say hello to every one of you and uh, to my friend Van James. Thank ah. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. What a surprise. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's 3 a.m. here in Taiwan. So for oh. me, it's uh, a little bit hard, but I success. Thank you. Good to see you. Hi, Leon. Leon. He's from Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> I was a student of Peter Stebbing, so and met met you, Van, if you're listening. Oh yes, I remember you, Carola. Uh, yeah. I only am on co coming on the phone, so I'm I'm sure I'll miss a lot, but I thought I'd take a chance and just do what I might. Carolyn, it will be recorded, so you're good, so you can watch it later. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Briar from Cape Town in South Africa. Ah. South Africans. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Van. I'm an old friend. Oh, from hi. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you now? Are you in L.A.? I'm in Santa Monica, which is west of L.A. Yeah. Ah, mm. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Dear friends, we have still a few seconds. Uh, if you're comfortable, please type hello from your place and where are you from? So using um, I am admitting more friends. It's 3 a.m. here in Western Australia. Oh. Hi, Heather. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. You are again our doing hero. <laughs> 3 a.m. This is Perch, West Australia, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Lovely place. The end of the world. Yeah. The most isolated main city in the world. Mm. Oh, I see Karanani, you're there. Hello, hi Ben. <clears throat> I made it. Carol <laughs> Alexander, oh. Los Angeles. Okay, here is friends from Scotland and uh, of course from South Africa. Yeah, two people from Scotland. Very nice. Welcome. More Chicagoans are coming. Mary Tom. Yeah, the people that are closest will always be the last. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> yeah, but we have great weather in Chicago. Good. So it's cooler a little bit now. All right. So uh, it's uh, one minute after 2 o'clock p.m. here in uh, Heartland in Chicago. Yeah. It's nine o'clock in Van's place, which is island of Oahu, Hawaii, Honolulu. And um, dear friends, welcome. So we're starting our season and uh, our first guest, uh, this is Van James from the Anthroposophical Society in Hawaii. Uh, with his online presentation, Rudolf Steiner's use of the mandala principle. So I'd like to formally introduce Wen and uh, just mention who he is and his achievements. So Wen James is a graduate of the San Francisco Art Institute, uh, Emerson College in UK, and also Malschule am Goetheanum. He is an international guest tutor at Waldorf Teachers Training Centers and uh, University Art Departments in Asia, Oceania and America. He is a mentor for Gradalis Teacher Education, the Academy of Himalayan Art and Child Development. And he is a regular presenter of Neutral Studio. It's uh, online. Uh, I believe it's YouTube channel. He's a class holder in the School of Spiritual Science and a council member of the Visual Arts section of North America. He is also editor of Pacifica Journal. Wen is active visual artist and an award-winning author of numerous books on culture and the arts, including Spirit of Art, The Secret Language of Form, and Ancient Sites of Hawaii series. 
drawing with hand, head, and heart, painting with hand, head, and art, out of the blue, and uh, teaching art history. Ben lives in Honolulu, Hawaii, with his wife, Bonnie. And I would like to add, uh, uh, when uh, his 26 years spent as chairman of Anthroposophical Society in Hawaii, and 36 years as teacher in Waldorf School. Yeah, dear Wen, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And hello, everyone. Aloha kako. Thank you for joining this uh, exploration into how Rudolf Steiner utilized, made use of the mandala principle in, in his work in various ways. And I'd like to start with an example of an audio mandala that he does, a verse hymn that goes like this. Spirit of God, fill thou me. Fill me in my soul. To my soul give strength. Strength also to my heart. My heart that seeks for thee. Seeks thee with earnest longing. Longing to be whole and well whole and well and full of courage. Courage, gift from the hand of God, gift from thee, O Spirit of God. Spirit of God, fill thou me. Now you'll notice in this verse, in this verse hymn, that each line ends with a phrase with a verbal picture that then begins the next line. And this continues throughout the entire verse in a way that it cycles, it recycles the imagery from the previous line into the next line. And the entire verse ends with the same lines, Spirit of God, fill thou me, with the same lines that begin it. So it's a round, a round of verbal mandala. Now we're gonna look at uh, some other ways that Rudolf Steiner utilized this mandala principle in his work. But I'd like to give, first of all, a, a background on the mandala principle, how it's been used uh, historically, throughout time and in different places. So I'm going to share my screen. So the word mandala is Sanskrit, one of the oldest written languages on earth. Manda means essence or cream. It means the highest point. Whereas la can mean container or vessel or signpost can mean indication. So mandala actually means an essence container, an essence container. It's usually found in the form of a circle. Now we often say mandala and in English, we mean a circle. A circle comes from the Latin word circa, which means around. So we say circa 1400 means around the year 1400. And circus also has this uh, reference to the Latin circa, meaning circle. And if you look at some of the oldest cultures in the world, for instance, uh, the Australian Aborigines, uh, we have someone from Perth here where I actually was giving a talk on mandalas in Perth and an elder Aborigine uh, told me that the name Guri Guri was not a place because I used it in my talk and said, this picture is uh, Guri Guri. And she said, no, Guri Guri is a 
is a spiritual place. It's not located physically on the earth. And this is what uh, indigenous peoples would do. They would create the circle forms in order to make an axis mundi, a center of the earth, and draw in mana, draw in the spiritual forces. And if you see a, a modern Aboriginal painting there on the left, you see how these, these sacred places, which could be campsites, they could be water holes, they could be lovemaking places, they would be connected with song lines. And so here you have this verbal chanting that would take place that would lead you from one sacred place represented by the mandala to another. These circular forms can be found as petroglyphs, as rock carvings, all over the world. There above is a picture from Scandinavia. Uh, it's often interpreted that maybe these are stars and grouped together in constellations. It's not known what these forms were for. However, the ones below uh, from Hawaii here, uh, carved in lava rock, out in isolated places, it is known what some of them were used for, that they were carved in the rock so that the umbilical cord stump of a newborn child wrapped with some of its mother's hair would be placed in this receptacle, this essence container, and then a rock would be placed over the top of it. And being in this form, in this mandala form, would receive the, the mana from the universe, from the cosmos, would ray in and help the development of this child. Maria Gumbudis, uh, the late uh, Lithuanian uh, archaeologist, said about these forms, these are the symbols of the center, the source or focal point where life begins and flows out, increasing in concentric circles and arcs. If it were possible to count all cup marks, artificial and natural, circles, concentric and open, and dot in circle motifs, it would become clear that these symbols are the most numerous of all, and therefore germinal. However, when we think of the term mandala, we think of designs like this, the Sri Yantra mandala uh, from Tibetan Buddhism. And you see in the very center circle, you have uh, nine intersecting triangles, four pointing upwards, five pointing downwards. The downward pointing triangles are the yoni or the shakti, the, the female principle. The ones pointing up are the shiva or lingam, the male principle. And in the very center, you see a dot, the bindu, which the meditant focuses his or her concentration on while contemplating, while going into meditation on this yantra. It's surrounded then by double rings of stylized lotus petals, and then placed in a square format with open doors to the four directions and ramps leading out, leading downward, sometimes considered stairways. And this would be visualized by the Buddhist uh, meditant. Now, much more complex mandalas are designed out of sand, colored sand. Sometimes uh, in earlier times, precious gems would be ground up and used. Uh, the monks would have a, a hollow, cone-like instrument with ribbing on the outside. You see them uh, rubbing the ribbing so that a vibration will send out 
a very narrow stream of these this colored sand so they can draw very precisely with this instrument and they're not wearing masks because it's during the pandemic but because they don't want to blow the sand off of their framework uh, because it's very tentative the drawing Here you see a painted tonka. Besides using sand, one can use paint. Uh, mandalas are made also of wood and of metal, and sometimes even of yak butter. And you can see this large circle contains these uh, three squared uh, palaces or terraced platforms of a temple. And in the very center is in this particular mandala, the Kala Chakra mandala, is the Kala Chakra Buddha in embrace with Vishvamata, his uh, female consort. He represents compassion, she represents wisdom. And together they are the pinnacle of this, this architecture, because one. Uh, conceives of this as a as a sacred mountain or temple and sometimes they're done as three-dimensional forms the three levels are called the mind mandala the speech mandala and the body mandala and these represent different aspects of uh, Buddhist traditions and levels of consciousness, levels of activity, one might compare them with imagination uh, through pictures, in the body mandala, how would you say, uh, clairaudience, uh, speaking in the images, in the speech mandala, and intuition in the mind mandala, full oneness with the spirit. And this is all contained in the larger circle with seven rings representing the, the levels of, of Buddhist elements, the six elements. The, the four colors are the three primary colors and white. Uh, white represents openness, red strength and vitality, yellow humility and blue purity, but also infinity and life. This particular mandala, the Kala Chakra mandala is considered to be the favorite of the 14th present Dalai Lama, although it was conceived of by the fifth Dalai Lama of Tibet. When the initiation takes place, uh, it's usually two days to construct a mandala. And then on the 12th day, it is, it is dismantled. All the sand is collected, put in a vessel that's been blessed, and then is poured, returned to the cosmos through the, uh, the spirits of the water in a river or a lake. This procedure really is uh, connected with non-attachment. One returns the impermanent physical world to its, to its origins. Robert Thurman was a um, professor of, of comparative religions at Columbia University says, the mandala idea originated long before historical Buddhism. In the earliest level of Indian or even Indo-European religion, in the Rig Veda and its associated literature, mandala is the term for a chapter, a collection of mantras or verse hymns chanted in Vedic ceremonies perhaps coming from the sense of round, as in a round of songs. 
that the universe was believed to originate from the mantra hymns whose sacred sounds contained the genetic patterns of beings and things already shows a clear sense of mandala as world model. So here he indicates this practice that in ancient times, monks, lamas, uh, yogis would chant these verse hymns in rounds to bring up the sun in the morning and set it in the evening, that one was connected with all these phenomena that in fact were universe mandalas, cyclical uh, occurrences. And Robert Thurman goes on to say, our insight into the mandala principle allows us to see that this is not only a matter of vague cultural imagery uh, contributing to a vague personal sense of things, but is rather a matter of imaginal world patterning, directly affecting inner structuring of physical and mental senses through actual brain organization. So this practice of verbal or picturing making mandalas in one's meditation or as a sand painting, going through that activity actually lays down the neuro patterning to create the physical possibilities for more evolution of the spiritual dimension. Now this is Borobudur. You can see right away that it's a mandala. It's an architectural mandala. And it's a mandala that you don't picture, but you circumambulate. You walk around. Thomas Berry said of this building that it provides a setting for the appearance of deities and creates the setting for an initiatory experience of passing through the various realms of enlightenment. It is not a place to venerate the Buddha but to actively participate in the journey of becoming enlightened oneself, to become a bodhisattva. And you can see there are 10 terrace levels, the squared ones and then the round ones. There's an intermediate uh, level of transfer in between. And one would walk up to the first level walk around and depicted in relief carvings are the past lives of the Buddha and the story of his present life leading up to the rounded terraces where there are stories of Prince Sudhana and his journey to become a bodhisattva. So one has these visual impressions that one is receiving these stories in imagination for 12 miles walking around these terraces. One completes the first one, one goes up a flight of stairs and does the second, and then the third, and so forth, until one reaches the top where there are these little stupas inside of which are Buddhas. There are 72 Buddhas at the top of Borobudur. Now you can see this one in the foreground. Uh, the lattice framework of the stupa has been taken down so you can see the, the Buddha. But there are actually more than a thousand Buddhas on the entire structure itself. It's the largest Buddhist temple in the world now in a Muslim country, in Java, Yogyakarta. And Marcia Eliade, the French archeologist and anthropologist said, only the initiate who goes through all the galleries 
discovers gradually the planes of supersensible reality, the grades of meditation expressed iconographically. And here you see how one makes a spiral circuit going further and further up, 60 viewing points, as it were, along the way. Now, the mandala is something that is from the sacred into the profane, where it has become more a festival decoration and an enjoyable entertainment. And here you can see a festival time in India being celebrated uh, in a Waldorf school where the teachers show the children how to make sand and flower and candle mandalas. This is not just in Waldorf schools though, this is throughout the country. Almost every religion is involved in this tradition of making mandalas. This is from a public high school where girls are making this sunburst mandala out of different flower petals. And in the countryside, one can see there's even still the tradition that every day uh, the woman of the household will come out and with rice powder will draw a mandala on the threshold of the house to trap bad spirits from coming in and invite as a welcome mat good spirits. And people just walk over this during the course of the day. This would be done just as the sun is rising. And then the next day, another mandala would, would be drawn. And it's interesting, the mothers teach their daughters and the men uh, don't practice this at all. It's the female lineage that uses these rangoli or olam. In China, one sees the very well-known mandala, the Tai Chi Tu, with its yin and yang principle. Now, once you divide the circle, which is a picture of the universe in microcosm, it's a picture of wholeness, indivisibility, all encompassedness. When it's divided, then you get black and white, light and dark, male and female, positive and negative. You get all of the uh, polarities that exist in physical existence. Once you separate out of the wholeness of the mandala. And here you see it in, in connection with the trigrams of the I Ching where you would uh, take coins and you would throw them uh, and see which trigrams arise. And you can look up in a book the, the verses, the text that have to do with what is happening at that moment based on this system of the I Ching. Now, this is still practiced by many people. Uh, but you see the center is this mandala. The um, 17th, 18th century uh, Zen abbot Gibbon Senge, after meditation, would do calligraphy, uh, sometimes very playful calligraphy like this one, where it says, eat this, then drink tea. It's puzzled art critics for centuries now. What does this, this artist priest mean by this? But you see this wonderful circle, this wonderful mandala that he places there. Eat this, then have tea. Now the Navajo and Hopi Native Americans, uh, the Indians of the Southwest, also do 
sand paintings. Actually, they call them dry paintings. And um, they say these mandalas are places where the gods come and go. These dry paintings, places where the gods come and go. So they will draw these using no tools like the Buddhist monks have developed, but using simply their hands, like those who draw Indian rangoli with rice powder. Here they use colored sands, um, make images that will draw the forces of various spirits through the images into the picture and usually used for healing will have the ill person sit or sleep on the images. Now here's an example where you see the four gods of the directions uh, in a kind of swastika form. Now swastika is also a Sanskrit word which means that which is good. It's only been twisted by use in the West now to mean the opposite, but it's still used in Asia, the swastika to indicate the, the spiritual powers within the four directions for uh, the four arms of the solar wind uh, create a swastika form. That's where it comes from. It's a solar form. And this is a particularly interesting dry painting because you have bears depicted and honeybees in the very center where this Tao cross form is, you have bear footprints. And this was given for women who were out of balance with their organism. And they would be asked to sit on this image and eat honey, which had been extracted from the stomach of a bear. Now, how they got this honey from the stomach of a bear would have been quite a process. You can imagine how difficult it would be filling this prescription. Anyway, that's uh, what this sand mandala has to do with. One has medicine wheels, uh, which have now been dated to around the time of the Egyptian pyramids. For a long time, historians could not believe that uh, Native Americans had the understanding for the movement of the stars in such a way that they could construct an exact observatory like these medicine wheels. But now it's, uh, it's becoming more accepted. Shields would be made as mandalas for warriors. Young men would go off and have their vision quests after fasting and doing certain ritual practices. They'd come back with the images they received in their dreams or their visions, put them on their shields, and they believed this protected them from uh, their enemies. Uh, even they felt bullets could not hurt them because of the images. And it's not the buffalo hide that protected them from arrows and bullets, but the images. And it's said that um, before battles, they would actually roll these, these shields to see if they would land with the image upright or the image facing the earth, where if it was facing down, they would know they would die bravely the next day. Also bulls. Now these are Native American bulls from Pueblo peoples in the Southwest. And you can see they're decorated with images. But if you think back to, the, to even prehistoric times, the bull is this mandala. It's an essence container. It receives the substance that have co has come from the outer world, 
from the larger world, from the universe, and has been placed in this mandala. And these are all ritual bowls. You can see that they have a hole punctured in them because once they were used for the ritual they were made for, they were no longer to be used for anything else. So they would be killed. Uh, they would be punctured through so that they could no longer be used as a mandala. So baskets also, on the left you see a Pima Native American basket with a design woven into it of a labyrinth. And this is a labyrinth form that one finds all over the world. You can see it on Greek coins. And it's usually referred to as the, the Cretan labyrinth because of this significant Greek appearance on coins. But it shows this, this journey that one makes. In the Pima Native American baskets, it represents Mother Earth from which the people have arisen, that they have gone on this long journey out through the labyrinth. And of course, in the Cretan labyrinth, it uh, represents the struggle of Theseus to overcome the Minotaur. Other labyrinth mandalas have evolved now from this seven circuit into the 11 circuit at various Christian cathedrals as Chartres Cathedral here uh, outside of Paris. And pilgrims would come to the, the cathedral. They would drop to their knees at the beginning of the labyrinth walk around on their knees with their rosaries or with their prayer book and make the journey into the center as a kind of uh, substitute for the journey to Jerusalem. And there are stories of their recordings of people reaching the center, looking up towards the altar and having transformative, ecstatic, spiritual experiences through this tracing of this particular form within this mandala context. The rose window at, at um, Chartres Cathedral is the same size as the labyrinth. And if you were to bring the wall, the west wall that it is on, down to the floor, it would go right over would cover basically the interior of the labyrinth. And it in itself being colored light tells the story of different saints, holy people, the genealogy of Mary and of Jesus and so forth. People were illiterate at this time and they would follow the stories, they would enter into the stories the Christian legend through the pictures. And this striving then for domes in cathedrals and churches was so that one would have, again, this, this mediating design between the cosmos, the heavens, as the large dome of God and the dome of our own skull the architecture would be this intermediary. And you can see in various churches, they would picture this divine world through which one could enter through the mandala by means of the mandala. Many pictures depict uh, Jesus, uh, the Son of God and God creating the universe, which is a mandala. Here on the right, you see God the Father overseeing his mandala of creation. He's meditating on this mandala. And this is interesting because Rudolf Steiner said that 
God is the religion of humanity, but humanity is the religion of the gods. Humanity is the religion of the gods. And here God is practicing his religion, which is creation. On the left is an illuminated manuscript done by Hildegard von Bingen, an 11th century Benedictine abbess. Because of her visions, because of her clairvoyance, she was lucky. She was taken in by the church and not burned as a witch. And this painting you see here is her third vision of humanity. And she, she wrote songs, she wrote music, and described these visions. She says this particular one is the human person is the form and fullness of creation. The human person is the form and fullness of creation. So here you see the mandala is not just a Buddhist practice, if, as many people think, uh, but it is a Christian practice. And in fact, every religion in the world, although I haven't brought um, examples for everyone, uses the mandala. This is from a 15th century manuscript a Neoplatonic manuscript called Di Sfera, in an Italian manuscript, where it was used as a healing practice. If someone was diagnosed with very little Saturn forces, they might be given some herbs that had to do with Saturn, you know, maybe some pine. Uh, they might be given something with lead in it, and they would be asked to meditate, to contemplate on this first seal of the god Saturn. If they were lacking Venus, they would be asked to contemplate the last one, the lower right, Venus. So depending on the diagnosis they received, they would be seen as lacking one of the planetary forces and be asked to then contemplate this mandala to give them back some of that, that energy, some of those forces. We'll see this a little bit later in Rudolf Steiner's work. But to continue on at the time of the Renaissance, Madonna and child pictures were often done as a tondo, the circular painting, so that it became more of a mandala. Every, every picture really is a mandala of sorts in that it, it is an essence container. But to bring it into the circle, uh, into this special form, we'll see this as we go on, gives it a certain power. And here you see a Raphael painting of the Madonna and child and a St. John on the left and another child who may very well be suggesting the, the more esoteric tradition of the two lineages of the two Jesus children. But that's another story. Robert Flood, Jakob Burma, all the alchemists would use the mandala, would use this circle form to show their conception of the universe. Now, Robert Flood, his principles are, are illustrated in this engraving on the left, where you have nature standing there as a female figure bound to God above with her right hand and to humanity down below in her, with her left hand. And all the arts and sciences are depicted there in the, the center of the earth. Jakob Berman's work shows the, the almighty in the symbol of the hexagram, the two 
triangles interlocked, which then separate down into the, the light and dark mandalas, and then in a lightning flash come together to create the bottom mandala uh, with the, the zodiac and the planets, the universe below there. So we see this use of the mandala everywhere. In the Christian tradition, the seven seals of the apocalypse are shown here. And these also we will come back to. Now, when we come into the 20th century, someone like Carl Jung discovers the mandala through his own personal practice. Uh, he says, in accord with the Eastern conception, the mandala symbol is not only a means of expression, but it works in effect. It reacts on its maker. Very ancient magical effects lie hidden in this symbol, the magic of which has been preserved in countless folk customs. So here he is looking at a Tibetan mandala. But he began during the First World War to create, draw a circle, and bring pictures and images and symbols into it uh, from his dreams, from his uh, waking life, uh, during a crisis that he was having at that time. He practiced this for uh, 13, 14 years, two, two seven-year life cycles before he, before he started having his patients work with mandalas. Here you can see an example of one of his mandalas. Uh, and he says, I sketched every morning in a notebook, a small circular drawing, a mandala, which seemed to correspond to my inner situation at the time. So he began to see that there's, there's something that happens through doing this practice of working with a mandala. Here's another one of his with very uh, esoteric mythological symbols in it. And he says, my mandalas were cryptograms concerning the state of the self which was presented to me anew each day. It became increasingly plain to me that the mandala is the center. It is the exponent of all paths. It is the path to the center to individuation. And again, I knew that in finding the mandala as an expression of the self, I had attained what was for me the ultimate. Yeah, and his work has continued on and Jungian psychologists even today do mandala therapy with people. And as far as I've been able to gather how they interpret and diagnose mandalas is they see what happens in the upper part of the mandala having to do with the higher future self. What is in the lower part has to do with the collective unconscious. To the left and the right are the male and female tendencies. And in the center is the, the present moment, what is most important to the person doing the mandala. That's a rather structured way of looking at the mandala, but it's, it's something that, that might work in some cases. And Jung said further, the fact that images of this kind have under certain circumstances a considerable therapeutic effect on their authors is empirically proved and also readily understandable in that they often represent very bold attempts to see and put together apparently irreconcilable opposites and bridge over apparently hopeless splits. 
even the mere attempt in this direction usually has a healing effect. Now, I'm going to come out of my screen share for a moment. This would be a good point to take a little two minute break for you to get something to drink or use the, the WC, but also get a pencil and a piece of blank paper. So we're going to do a little drawing, okay? A blank paper and a pencil or a pen, uh, a crayon would be even better because it has more texture to it. So grab that if you can. And if you have any questions at this point, on um, this is pretty much the background. And now we'll be looking at how Rudolf Steiner uses the mandala principle. If you have any questions, you could put those in the chat for, um, for Andre uh, to read off, or uh, I don't know, Andre, if you want them to unmute and just say them themselves. Yes, I mean, we usually using our electronic hands, which are inserted in this system. Yeah, but uh, now let's take a break and we will figure out. So dear friends, two, three minutes, and uh, we're going to be back to continue. Take your pencils and sheets of papers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so, everyone have their paper and a pencil? What I would like you to do is in the very center, uh, not going out to the periphery of your paper, in the center, do a scribble just any kind of scribble. You'll all have a different scribble technique. And I'm sure it will be a masterpiece. Go ahead, put your scribble there in the center. Okay. And uh, why don't you hold it up so we can all see your scribble in your camera. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Good scribbles. Okay, now first take a take a good close look at your scribble and feel it. You don't have to intellectualize it, just feel what is happening there. And then draw a circle around it. Draw a circle around that chaotic scribble and feel what has happened. What has happened there? The chaos of that scribble begins to come into a harmony through the circle, encapsulating it, holding it. Uh, this is something that Jung was pointing to in this quotation that I read. The fact that images of this kind under certain circumstances have a considerable therapeutic effect on their authors is empirically proved and also readily understandable in that they often represent very bold attempts to see and put together apparently irreconcilable opposites and bridge over apparently hopeless splits. Even the mere attempt in this direction usually has a healing effect. So one can say that, that what we've done there as a scribble has begun to be healed. We've brought something of a therapeutic effect to that. It's starting to become more harmonious by means of that circle, by means of that mandala. We're gonna do another drawing later, but I'd like to go back to my screen share. If you can position your computer in such a way that you can stand back from it and see this picture, this is from the 14th, uh, 1500s uh, by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. 
And he was working at the same time that Leonardo da Vinci was doing his Vitruvian Man. He was working with this problem, as you can call it, of squaring the circle and working with understanding the proportions of the human being. Now this is, he did these six drawings, these six illustrations of six different positions that the human being can take. Of course, we can take many, many others, but in a certain sense, we might say these are archetypal positions. And Rudolf Steiner took these positions and made them part of his Eurythmy practice as he was developing the art form of Eurythmy, he used these six movements and brought verses to them, brought uh, aphoristic statements to them. And what I'd like you to do is stand in front of your computer and actually move to these positions so you can feel how the human being is a mandala within the universe. And if you stand with your feet, stand with your feet just uh, uh, an inch or two apart, bring your arms out to your sides horizontally, parallel with the ground. This is the first position, I think speech. So you think speech. And then you move your feet a little bit apart and bring your arms up so that your fingertips, as your arms are stretched out, your fingertips are at the level of your throat, of your larynx, and you think, I speak. And then you move your arms down to the level of your solar plexus, and you move your legs apart, so you make this kind of human gesture of the five-pointed star, and you think, I have spoken. And then you move your arms up, your legs further apart. So you're making this kind of cross. And you think, I seek myself in the spirit. You move the arms down so that your fingertips are at the level of the top of your head. You move your legs back in, not as much as the first or second gesture, and not as far as the third gesture. And you think, I feel myself within myself. And then you bring your feet back together, your arms straight up, pointing to the heavens, not bending your elbows or your knees, and think, I am on the way to the spirit. And sometimes it's added to myself. So this is the I think speech, Eurythmy gesture. And you can see from the drawing how it creates these mandala positions of the human being. This is one way that Rudolf Steiner incorporated the mandala principle. Okay, if you did actually go through and move that, uh, go ahead, sit down. This is a picture of the 1907 Munich Congress where Rudolf Steiner had taken over the direction of a theosophical German branch branch of the German Theosophical Society. He organized the, the Congress. He had red fabric plastered all over the walls, over a million red, a bright red. In the entranceway, he had green fabric put on the walls so that as people came in off the gray streets of Munich, they go through this calming green color and then come into the auditorium where this bright red was covering the entire auditorium. He had 
paintings of columns done on wood panels placed around the room. And he had these mandalas that you will recognize as the seven seals of the apocalypse. John the evangelist, when in exile on Patmos, had uh, these visions, which then later people made into, into picture form as seals. And in fact, Rudolf Steiner, Rudolf Steiner never used the term mandala as far as I've been able to see. He always refers to seals. Now seals is a word that is re related to uh, signe, which has to do with, with stamping, closing, even making secret, but at the same time revealing through the stamp, uh, through the picture, what is present. And here in this, uh, this series of seven images, Rudolf Steiner said of them, you can see how the whole world presents itself in such seals. And because the Magi and the initiates have put the whole cosmos into them, they contain a mighty force. You can continually turn back to these seals and you will find that by meditating on them, they will disclose infinite wisdom. They can have a mighty influence on the soul because they have been created out of cosmic secrets. Yeah, so here he's actually saying, meditate on these seals, on these mandalas, on these images. And of course, they come from uh, original text in the, the New Testament. So those were on the walls of this 1907 Munich Congress. And there Rudolf Steiner sort of drew a line in the sand pointing the theosophists to if one does not make one's spiritual practice a reality in the physical world through the images and the gestures and the colors that one uses around one, then it is not a real spiritual practice. And this was part of the division uh, point that began between Rudolf Steiner then establishing uh, an anthroposophical society and separating from the Theosophical Society. He, on the left, you see his sketches for the mandala that uh, he had an artist paint for this Congress. Now here you see these two images I showed you already, the, the seven seals of the apocalypse on the left, done much earlier than Steiner's version. And images from the sphera of the planets, the seven planets used for healing. Well, at the same Congress, Rudolf Steiner designed and had put into the program these forms, very basic graphic designs, which are now referred to as the planetary seals. And he said of these forms, it is not intended here that the forms should be grasped intellectually, but that they should be experienced artistically through the feelings in imagination. For every line, every curve, indeed the whole being of these forms is such that by submerging oneself in them, forces slumbering in one's soul can be awakened. And these forces lead to concepts of the great mysteries of the world, which lie at the foundation of the cosmic evolution of earth and humanity. So here again, he's saying, he's saying to submerge oneself in these forms 
the great mysteries of the world can be discovered. He had said in another place, and this is this is his introduction really to the theme of metamorphosis in art. This is really the first place we see the principles of metamorphosis coming into art. And he uses the mandala for this purpose. He said that everything that occurs physically and evolves over time has a sevenfold process to it. Everything in the physical world that evolves through time has a sevenfold process. Now we can simplify that by saying, well, the, everything has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. But if we look at uh, the subtle changes that happen between the beginning and the middle, and the middle and the end, there's actually a sevenfold process. And this sevenfold process, uh, which we see in the plant the, from the seed to the sprout, to the stems, to the leaf, to the buds, to the blossoms, and to the seed again, this process happens in everything physical that evolves over time. For instance, in this presentation that's happening physically over time, besides a beginning, a middle, and an end, we could go through and see that there's a transformation that's actually sevenfold as well. Uh, Rudolf Steiner pointed to the, the importance of this rhythm of the sevenfoldness, which as you can see, becomes a circle. Now this is a pattern that uh, Brian Gray, who does a lot of work with the planetary seals, has put together of all the forms in one, how they're contained then in this mandala form. But if we look at how Rudolf Steiner describes the eightfold path in connection with the week, we have a, a weekly mandala where one can go through a practice from Saturday through the week to Friday and Saturday again, following the path of right opinion, right judgment, right speech, and so forth, in this way affecting the different chakras gradually opening or rotating the chakras. So another mandala, this weekly pattern that one can enter into. This then is also expanded in the calendar of the soul, which many of you will know. These verses, 52 verses throughout the year, which can be seen as a yearly mandala. And the yearly mandala can be transformed then into the lemniscate, two circles, two mandalas. And we'll see how Rudolf Steiner incorporates this transformation through architecture. But if you look at his verses, in the year's course, alternates ceaselessly summer's abounding growth and winter's earth repose. So in the course of human life, vigor of waking day and peaceful bounty of sleep. Yet does the spirit-filled soul live on sleeping and waking? So in the spirit, the soul of the earth lives through the seasons changing, summer and winter. So one can see in the polarities of summer and winter, they nevertheless are creating this mandala of the year, this circle of the year. Now, this Munich Congress of 1907, Rudolf Steiner was approached by a young man, 
uh, Karl Stockmeyer, who asked him, what would the building look like that contains these columns that are painted around the room? And Rudolf Steiner apparently became quite excited and followed up on this, designing the Mosch Bau, the Mosch building uh, outside of Karlsruhe in Germany. It's still there as a kind of little clubhouse, esoteric clubhouse. As a student, I had an opportunity to do the renovation painting uh, with plant colors in here. It's nice to spend a day in this, this building. It's an oval shape. It's not exactly a circle, but an oval is nevertheless a mandala. So one is enclosed in this mandala form when one enters a building of this shape. Now, this was also then reproduced in a larger fashion in Stuttgart for the Theosophical Society there uh, before it became the Anthroposophical Society. Uh, the building was uh, destroyed by the Nazis in the Second World War. But around this time of this building impulse, Rudolf Steiner also began writing plays, the mystery dramas. And here you see four seals that he had intended to be encapsulations of the theme, the portal of initiation in the upper left. And the other, he actually had intended to do five plays and five mandalas for them. But you see the, the sevenfoldness of the first one, the fourfoldness in the second, the swastika form, the pentagram, the fivefold below, and the 12 form and the one for the four mystery dramas. So this was something that he felt in graphic design that uh, book covers, that logos should speak of what one is being led into as far as text in a book or the the logo for a company or a building. Then out of the architectural impulse of the oval shaped building, yeah, going from the circle, stretching it into the oval, it then stretches so far that it becomes a lemniscate. It becomes two circles joined together. And this was for the Johannesbau, the, the John building. Uh, the mystery dramas had it as its central character, Johannes, who was an artist, who was a painter. And so he was calling this also in reference to St. John, calling these this building the Johannesbau. Because of permitting problems, they weren't able to build it there, and he was offered land in Dornach, where then the first Goethe Anum was designed. And that is, as mentioned, two interlocking mandalas, two interlocking domes, rotundas, cupolas for the ceilings. Uh, here you see some images of the, the sacred geometry that are involved in this building. But the unique feature of it is that when you sit in the auditorium, you can experience the circular nature, the round form, which gives one the experience of peace, of restfulness. I don't have to go anywhere. This is, I'm at rest in the circle. But because there's this interlocking dome uh, attached to it, the stage area, you can experience the corridor effect. That is the straight line, the horizontal, the hallway into the second round area. And 
one can choose then to experience this feeling of movement that you get when you're in a hallway, when you're in a, a building like a basilica, where it's longitudinal, where it is an axial structure. You experience that movement. And sitting in the auditorium under the circular form, you, you can choose in freedom whether you experience the one feeling or the other. The mandala effect or the waking up to movement. And here you see, if you were sitting in the auditorium and you looked up, uh, it would be an experience like this. This is a model that has been created that you can actually go inside to experience this. Very unique building for its time, a remarkable building. Now, when Rudolf Steiner was having this first Goethe Anam built, the First World War was going on. There were artists and professional people and workers from uh, dozens of countries that were working on this building. And he gave lectures about the building and about architecture. And in a series of lectures called Ways to a New Style in Architecture, he did these four drawings. And what I'd like you to do is get your piece of paper again, uh, turn it over or get a, get a clean sheet and draw this first form. Draw this first form. You can keep going around if you, you know, if it turns out looking like a papaya, uh, you can adjust it, fix it, get it, get it to be more so that the radius is the same throughout the form. Sketch that circle. What do you feel from that? What do you experience from that? We could take some time and get some, uh, some reflection, some feedback, but if you have some thoughts, why don't you just put them in the chat box and I'll read you what Rudolf Steiner said. He says, selfhood, egohood can be felt in form. And above all, when we pass from a purely mathematical conception of form to a feeling in form, we can acquire a perception of egohood, selfhood in the perfect circle. If you realize this, you will readily understand that what follows from it. If the true living sentient human being confronting a circle senses the feeling of egohood, selfhood arising in his or her soul, or if when we see a fragment of a circle, we feel that it typifies the independent self, we're learning to live in form. And the characteristic of really living feeling is the capacity for living in forms. Now, so this is interesting that he challenging one to live through one's feeling as perception, using one's feeling as perception to experience form, to feel the form. And when we, when we truly feel the circle as a form, not as a mathematical intellectual construct, but feel the, the formness of this figure, we get the sense of self, of egohood. And then he goes on to, to say, now push out as though this, from the inner part of the circle, from the inwardness of the circle, it's pushing out. When you feel the strength of the, the center is greater, one will get this rounded feeling of the form. 
but if you get a form like the third one, C, where it's jagged, it's serrated, then one has the feeling the outer forces are stronger, are dominant. And in the last form, one feels that movement is coming in, that there is movement involved, whereas the other three forms were stationary. These forms come into movement. Yeah, so this is interesting aspect to the principles that Rudolf Steiner had introduced for architecture. It's experienced through the roundness, through the curved, through the straight line, and capturing movement. All of these are mandala forms. One could see then in the first Goethe Anam the sketches that he made for artists to paint into the large cupola. He did as kind of mandala forms. The upper one of Atlantis, the one below it as the Persian human being with Zarathustra sitting there sending forces into the, the forehead of the Persian man. And over on the right, the, the circle of 12, having to do with the will and future incarnations. Now, Rudolf Steiner, when he gave lectures, he did this in the tradition of a professor. He was, after all, a PhD in philosophy. And he would often have a blackboard would have a blackboard behind him and we, he would do diagrams, he would write words and he would draw pictures to illustrate what he was uh, communicating through his spiritual scientific research, which according to uh, people who lived at that time and experienced him, he would channel through to the audiences these blackboard drawings would be erased uh, when the lecture was over. But by 1919, one of, the, one of the women who followed him on his lecture tours had the idea and presented it to Marie Steiner and to Rudolf Steiner. Why not put some black paper over the blackboard and then use the chalks when the lecture is over, we can roll up those drawings and keep them. So from 1919, this was done. Uh, not every lecture was caught in this way and not every lecture he did blackboard drawings, uh, but you can see in the upper left, one of the early ones where he's describing the threefold social order in connection with imagination, inspiration and uh, intuition, where he creates this mandala form and uh, the working of, of work and capital all working together uh, in a threefold way. Uh, other ones where it's quite simple, you get a simple circle, you get some colors that are expressing different, different inner gestures. Down below, one sees from his color lectures where he's describing the image colors, how black is the spirit image of the lifeless, how green is the lifeless image of the living, how peach blossom is the living image of the soul, and how white is the soul's image of the spirit and how this creates a mandala, the way one can think of these image colors, the way they relate to each other. And then a mandala over on the right of the progress and the, the qualities of the time of year, you see the fourfoldness of the seasons depicted there, as we've already uh, seen a little bit of. 
1923, Rudolf Steiner did this painting, The Threefold Human Being, where you see three figures in this oval shape, yellow, green, and blue. And uh, the, the top figure is yellow, the middle figure is green, and then the bottom figure has these skinny black legs and this red, big red spot in its center. A year later in 1924, uh, during an esoteric lesson, he's describing how thinking, feeling, and willing are held together by the physical body and by the ego and representing that through this circle, this mandala holds these soul forces of thinking, feeling, and willing together. So he essentially is doing a diagram of the painting you see on the left again, but it's a mandala. It's using the mandala principle. And finally, one of the later uh, blackboard drawings uh, done in the curative course, again in 1924, he's describing to the curative educators how there's no system for working with mentally and emotionally handicapped people one simply has to use intuition. And he describes how you can develop intuition. He, he tells these curative educators, think of a circle in blue with a yellow dot in the center. Imagine this, picture this as a meditation, a circle in blue and a yellow dot in its center and say to yourself in me is god before you go to sleep in me is god and in the morning picture to yourself a yellow circle with a blue dot in the center and say to yourself I am in God. And imagine then during the course of the day, this blue dot expands into being a circle and you picture it again at night. The yellow circle from the morning contracts into a point. And then you picture again to yourself in me is God. And during sleep, that yellow dot expands, the blue circle contracts, and you repeat this meditation. You're using a mandala picture and creating a mandala through the course of your waking and sleeping. This is a, a beautiful imagination a beautiful meditation that is in the form of a mandala. And Rudolf Steiner says, this is how you can develop the capacity so that when you're in the classroom with a mentally handicapped person, you know what to do. You have the intuition that's required because You've practiced this mandala meditation throughout the morning and the evening. Rudolf Steiner also, in one of the esoteric lessons in the early 20th century, he, he apparently told one of his pupils in this small esoteric group, picture how the point becomes a circle at infinity. And picture how the circle at infinity becomes a point, another uh, mandala practice. 
So the Christmas foundation stone, one can also find the mandala at work in that. And I won't go into detail of that uh, because of our time, but one can find in the very middle of this mantra, one can find the line for the Christ will in the encircling round hold sway. Now the encircling round in which the Christ will hold sway grants grace to souls in cosmic rhythms. So I thought I would end with coming back to this verse we started with so you can see it in print, how we have spirit of God fill thou me. And the filling begins the next line, ends with soul. The soul begins the next line, ends with strength, then strength to heart and heart to thee, thee to longing, longing uh, to wellness and wholeness, wholeness and wellness to courage, courage to God and this gift, spirit of God, fill thou me. You know, it's a wonderful vocal mandala. And um, that is the conclusion I had planned. I actually have a second conclusion, but I think it would be good to see if there are any, uh, any questions, any comments that people have. And if you wanna see the second ending, it would take us maybe too far. Questions in the in the chat? Uh, we do have some questions, um, but I would propose if people will speak live. And uh, we have usually order. So there is a button named reaction in the bottom of your screen. If you put your arrow in the bottom of your screen, you can see smiley this name of reaction so and click on it so one of buttons will be raise hand so click on raise hand and uh, you're you will be in line you will be in line to to speak to uh, and ask question from van Tracy, could you unmute yourself and go ahead Hi, Van. Thank you so much. I just was wondering if you could repeat the colors that you were saying uh, represented different things in the, in the mandalas of ancient times. I, I didn't catch what red was representative of. Well, red is usually representative of um, vitality, but in the, in the Buddhist tradition, it is strength and vitality. Okay. And then white was purity, yellow was humility, blue was purity, infinity, and life. Yeah. So, friends preferring to, to type. Uh, when can you maybe open your chat uh, box and uh, we can see? We would like to hear your voices. Just read your questions. So nice to see you again. Hello. Um, Martha. Hey, Martha. And love what you're doing. And I'm wondering, are you going to be uh, creating a, a book about this uh, coming up for the future? Um, I can recommend a book that I created some years ago, The Secret Language of Form. In there, there's an entire section on, uh, on the mandala. Okay, yeah. I I do I I do have that book and I, I but I can't find it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you. I found it so intriguing what you were bringing up about the power of creating the circle, and how it impacts the person doing it, in a therapeutic way. Um, and in the validation and confirmation that Steiner um, uses it so prolifically in his work, 
that um, that it really um, that the power of it to strengthen our own sense of ego of self could one go that far? Mm. Yes. Yeah, I think that that all forms speak, all forms express something, all of forms have a have a spiritual reality to them. And it was Rudolf Steiner who said, we need to make create forms so that the gods can speak to us. Yeah, and this is why it's so important why I put such an emphasis on the arts and a new style in the art that the forms, the sounds, the colors that we create and work with, they, they have a message. They speak to us. Uh, but what are they speaking to us is, of course, one of the big questions. And you can see that he, he does put this emphasis on the circle.